In the history of flight, we celebrate the inventors. We build statues for the pilots who broke the sound barrier and the astronauts who touched the moon. But there is a darker, quieter side to aviation history. It is a history written in twisted metal, scorched aluminum and silence. For decades, the greatest fear in aviation wasn't falling out of the sky. It was surviving the fall, only to die on the ground. Enter I. Irving Pinkel. He was a physicist at NACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, the predecessor to NASA. While others looked up at the stars, Irving Pinkel looked at the wreckage. In 1950, at the Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio, Pinkel asked a terrifying question. Why do people survive the impact of a plane crash, only to perish seconds later? To find the answer, he didn't use a chalkboard. He used a sledgehammer. You are standing at the edge of a custom-built runway. It is known as the Crash Fire Facility. It is a place designed for destruction. Pinkel and his team have acquired surplus military transport planes, C-46 commandos, C-82 packets, war horses that survived conflict only to meet their end here. But this isn't wanted on destruction. It is precise, calculated violence. Pinkel realises that the chaotic nature of a crash has masked the physics of fire. Eyewitness testimony is unreliable. Terror clouds memory. To save lives, Pinkel needs to slow time down. He rigs the runway with guide rails. He installs high-speed cameras protected by blast shields. He paints the aircraft white to contrast against the orange flames. The theory at the time was simple. Fuel tanks rupture, fuel hits a hot engine, and boom. But Pinkel suspects it is more complex. He suspects there is an invisible killer hiding in the physics of the crash. It's a Tuesday morning. The air is cold. The team retreats to the bunkers. A C-46, commando, unmanned and remote controlled, begins its final roll. It accelerates to 100 miles per hour. Impact. The violence is absolute. But look closely. Before the fire, there is the mist. Pinkle's cameras, rolling at thousands of frames per second, capture the culprit. When the fuel tanks rip open, the momentum of the crash atomizes the fuel. It doesn't just spill, it becomes an aerosol. A massive, combustible cloud that engulfs the fuselage in milliseconds. Now, the plane is flying inside a bomb of its own making. Pinkle watches the footage. He sees the ignition source. It isn't always the hot engine. It is the friction sparks, the metal belly of the plane grinding against the runway. It is the snapping of electrical wires. He realises that the current safety measures are useless. You cannot stop the fuel from spilling. You cannot stop the plane from breaking. If he is going to save the passengers, he has to change the chemistry of the crash itself. The data gathered from these crash fire tests was horrifying, but it was gold. Pinkle discovered that the temperature inside the cabin could rise to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit in less than 50 seconds. That was the deadline. That was the limit of human survival. If you couldn't get out in 50 seconds, you weren't getting out. Most engineers would look at that timeline and call it impossible. Irving Pinkle looked at it and saw a challenge. He didn't just want to study the fire, he wanted to kill it before he could breathe. How do you stop a fire that starts in a fraction of a second? You have to be faster than the spark. Irving Pinkel proposed a radical idea. If the ignition sources, the hot exhaust manifolds, the friction sparks, the electrical shorts, could be neutralized the moment impact occurred, the fuel mist would not ignite. He called it the crash fire inerting system. The concept was brilliant in its simplicity and terrifying in its execution. Pinkle designed a system that would detect a crash instantly, triggered by the deformation of the aircraft skin. The moment the plane hit the ground, the system would detonate. Not an explosive, but a pressurised blast of water and solvent sprayed directly onto the hottest parts of the engine. Simultaneously, it would cut the batteries to stop electrical sparks. It was an airbag for fire. The results were miraculous. In test after test, planes rigged with Pinkle's system slammed into the barriers, spewed thousands of gallons of high-octane aviation fuel, and 
didn't burn. The footage from the Lewis Research Centre stunned the aviation world. Pinkle had proven that crash fires were not acts of God. They were preventable mechanical failures. He had handed the airline industry the keys to survival. But the industry hesitated. Engineering is the art of compromise. Pinkle's system was heavy. It required water tanks, piping and sensors. In the 1950s, every pound of weight added to a plane was a pound of paying cargo, or passengers lost. The airlines did the math. The cost of the system and the weight penalty was deemed too high for the statistical rarity of a crash. It was a bitter pill for Pinkle. He had solved the problem, but he couldn't force the solution. But history wasn't done with Irving Pinkle. The world was changing. The propellers were disappearing. The jet age had arrived. With jets came new fuels, kerosene-based Jet A. It burned differently than the volatile Avgas of the war era. It was harder to ignite, but once it burned, it burned hotter. The crash dynamics changed. The engines weren't just hot metal blocks anymore. They were spinning turbines inhaling air. Pinkle adapted. He moved his research from the exterior to the interior. If he couldn't stop the fire on the outside, he would harden the inside. He began studying impact forces. He realised that during a crash, the seats often broke loose, piling passengers into the front of the cabin, crushing them before the fire even reached them. He realised the materials used in the cabins, plastics, fabrics, gave off toxic cyanide gas when they burned. Pinkle became the architect of the modern airplane seat. He advocated for seats that could deform to absorb energy, crush zones for the human spine. He studied the friction of materials. He looked at the layout of emergency exits. Every time you walk onto a modern airliner, you are walking through Irving Pinkle's laboratory. The reason the seats are fire retardant? Pinkle. The reason the floor lighting exists? Pinkle. The reason the fuel lines have breakaway valves? Pinkle. By the mid-1960s, Irving Pinkle was the supreme authority on aerospace safety. He had crashed more airplanes than any pilot in history. He understood the violence of the fall, but his greatest and most tragic challenge wasn't an airplane. It was a spacecraft sitting on a launch pad in Florida. January 27th, 1967. A routine plug-out test for the Apollo 1 mission. Astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White and Roger Chaffee are sealed inside the capsule. In seconds, a flash fire consumes the pure oxygen atmosphere. There is no escape. The hatch is sealed shut by internal pressure. The crew is lost. It is the darkest day in NASA's history. The moon landing is in jeopardy. The nation is in mourning. NASA Administrator James Webb knew there was only one man who could uncover the truth without bias. He called Irving Pinkle. Pinkle arrived at the Cape not as a mourner, but as a forensic scientist. He walked into the charred remains of the spacecraft. While others saw a tragedy, Pinkle saw a fuel load. Pinkle's investigation was ruthless. He ignored the politics of the space race. He looked at the materials. He found that in an environment of 100% pure oxygen, things that we consider safe become explosive. Velcro, nylon, paper, even the aluminum of the ship itself. He wrote the report that changed spaceflight forever. He told NASA that they had built a fire trap. He forced them to redesign the hatch to make it open outward in seconds, not minutes. He forced them to change the atmosphere mixture. He forced them to remove the flammable materials. When Neil Armstrong stepped onto the moon two years later, he did so in a ship that had been stripped and rebuilt according to the Pinkle standard. The safety of the Apollo program was built on the ashes of Apollo 1, sifted through by the hands of Irving Pinkle. Irving Pinkle retired in 1972. He passed away in 2008. You won't find his face on currency. You won't find a major airport named after him. But his legacy is everywhere. It is in the flammability standards stamped on your seat cushion. It is in the breakaway fuel valves in the wings. It is in the spacing of the emergency exits. In engineering, the highest form of success is invisibility. When a system works perfectly, you don't know it's there. When a plane crashes and the passengers walk away, they thank the pilot, they thank God. 
But they should also spare a thought for the physicist from Cleveland who spent his life studying the fire so that we wouldn't have to burn. Irving Pinkle taught us that safety is not an accident. It is a design choice. It is a battle fought in the laboratory, won in the wreckage, and paid for with the relentless pursuit of the truth.